Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another of Alan Parr's videos. In this one he explains why he thinks millennials are leaving the church, and offers some suggestions about how the church can get them back. Well, I'm not sure yet what the suggestions will be, but for me, the main thing that would have the best chance of getting me back is for the church to actually be teaching true things. So maybe they could work on that? Well. Let's see how Alan plans on wrangling me back into the fold. Recently I put a post out on my Instagram and on my YouTube channel asking the question, why are so many millennials leaving the church? And some of the responses that I got were very, very interesting. I don't know. I mean, with the look on your face, I'm half expecting the responses to be sexual things that you always wanted to do, but aren't allowed to, and so are living vicariously through those who have left the church. Well, Alan, I have a suggestion for you. Leave the church yourself and let your freak flag fly. It's a much better, more satisfying, happier, and healthier life. According to a recent poll, nearly 75% of baby boomers consider themselves Christians, but only around 50% of millennials would claim to be Christian. Good. That's a trend in the right direction. And the nun category is growing, at least in the US. Worldwide, Islam is on track to be the dominant religion by 2050, but we're just talking about the US here, so Let's just ignore that until I inevitably have to shift the focus of my channel to Muslim apologetics. Roughly two thirds of all millennials attend church only a few times a year or less. Four out of 10 millennials say they seldom if ever go. So the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why are so many millennials leaving the church? Well, according to a Pew Research survey on why some of the nuns have left religion, the number one reason given, coming in at 49% of respondents, was that they no longer believe. Which is actually a bit weird to me. Like, yeah, I'd expect that to be the number one reason, but I feel like if you still believe, you wouldn't be in the nun category. But hey, people are weird and none is a general category for anyone that just doesn't identify with any particular religion, rather than just people who actively reject religion. So I guess it does kind of track. But the bigger question that I want to address in this video is what can we do as a church to hopefully win them back? To have your message be a true message seems to be the number one thing that would get almost half of them back. Just convince them that it's true. Or Alternatively, another article from Pew found that in the very few areas where young adults are more religious than the older generations, there was a pattern of peace during the older generation's younger years, and widespread violence leading to civilian deaths during the young adults' lifetimes. So if you're exposed to violent conflict in your formative years, you are more likely to be religious as an adult. Now, this is just me speculating here, I haven't actually seen any data on this, but I feel like this phenomenon could account for much higher levels of religiosity throughout history. For a lot of human history, war and violence were not an uncommon part of life, and religion is a coping mechanism. Who dies in a war is pretty random, so if I behave right and pray right, maybe a higher power will protect me. And then survivorship bias confirms this hypothesis. I survived, and I prayed that I would survive, so God must have been looking out for me. What about those that didn't survive? Well, maybe they didn't pray, or if they did, they prayed wrong. So violence reinforces religious belief, and religion does have a history of spreading through violence. Now, I'm not saying religion is the cause of all the world's violence, nor am I saying that religious people are all violent, but statistically speaking, religion and violence do seem to be inextricably linked. Okay, so the first claim that many millennials will say about the church in terms of why they don't go is that the church is intolerant. That's certainly a reason why some would choose to leave a specific church, but I don't think that would be the cause of someone just stopping attending church altogether, unless they just don't have the time to find a more tolerant church in their location, because 
that was one of the semi-big reasons for being a nun as well. They're just too busy to attend regular services. Although, at this point it might be helpful to split the nuns into some other subcategories. A predictable 0% of self-identified atheists said that they didn't go to church because they're too busy, as opposed to 14% of the nothing in particular people. And again, if we're looking at this split, 82% of atheists stop going to church because they don't believe, with that number being 63% for agnostics. But I suppose if we're being honest with the data, the atheists and agnostics only make up about 37% of the nuns, and only 37% of the nothing in particular nuns said that they don't believe. So unfortunately, Alan might actually be addressing the more common concerns, which seem to be rather superficial if I'm honest. Like, they are genuine problems that churches have, but I would think that the main question in whether or not you attend a church should be whether or not you believe. So if anything, this data shows that we still have a long way to go when it comes to teaching healthy skepticism and critical thinking skills. Or another word they may use is church people are judgmental. Yep. Despite the admonition in the Bible to judge not lest ye be judged, and that whole vengeance is mine thus saith the Lord thing, which is supposed to be saying that you don't get to punish people for sins, that's God's job, churchgoers still insist on being judgmental towards those that they consider to be in the wrong, even though all sins are supposedly equal and everybody is a sinner. So under that view, no matter what your sin is, you are just as bad as everybody else. Did you wear mixed fabrics? That's just as bad as the gay couple being gay, so as long as you're enjoying your cotton polyester blend, you can't claim to be better than them. And actually, this is a point I would agree on. Being gay is just as bad as wearing mixed fabrics. That is to say, it's not bad at all, even though it is condemned by the Bible. According to the Pew Research Center, 57% of all millennials believe that the church is too judgmental as compared to only 37% of baby boomers. Yeah, because your biases tend to become entrenched in you when you are young. That's where the trope of racist old people comes from. The idea that they spent their formative years in a more racist time and are now too old to change. While I don't believe that they are too old to change their views, I do recognize that it is harder for older people to change their views, and so it makes sense that the older people, who are largely the ones running the churches, don't find them to be as judgmental as the young people because the churches line up with their biases. And obviously there is a danger of overgeneralizing here. I am not saying that old people are all a bunch of homophobic racists. In fact, the numbers are encouraging. Yes, older people do tend to be less accepting of homosexuality, but in the US, that acceptance is at an all-time high, with 64% of people over 50 agreeing that homosexuality should be accepted by society. So this is encouraging. So two things are happening here. The first thing is that you may feel like the church is too judgmental or intolerant because the church is promoting and preaching things that are going against what you want to do with your life and you don't like how that feels. Or alternatively, now that we have an unprecedented amount of access to real data from the real world, we've been able to figure out that the main harm that comes from breaking a lot of these rules that the church is setting down is found in how the church members treat the people who break these rules, rather than in these actions just being inherently harmful in and of themselves. Turns out, a lot of them are not, and the church is not willing to change with the times, so it's getting left behind. I mean, I'm sure it will change eventually, but most churches are still catching up with 19th century morality, so when it starts hurting their bottom line more, they'll start changing their tune in the hopes of winning people back, but not before then. You don't like the church telling you that you can't shack up, or that you can't have sex before marriage, or that you can't smoke weed, or you can't do all these different types of things, and so as a result, your natural knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, the church is intolerant. It's not just that it's intolerant, it's that a lot of those things are not harmful things. They're actually beneficial, and pressuring people to avoid them can be harmful. Not allowing sex before marriage causes people to get married younger because the sex drive is incredibly powerful. And when it comes to life decisions, would you ever suggest making a decision that is guaranteed to have a significant impact on the rest of your life blind without knowing exactly what the impact will be? How do you know if living with someone is desirable without first living with them? You don't know what habits they have that don't show up when you're both together outside of the home that you might find intolerable. Would you buy a car without test driving at first? 
and a car will have a much smaller impact on your life than who you are living with. So if you wouldn't buy a car without a test drive, why would you agree to spend the rest of your life living with a person when you have no experience living with them? And the same people who would encourage you to never live with anyone until you marry them will also tell you that divorce isn't an option. Once you're married, that's it. It's final. Of course, the church doesn't actually have the legal ability to stop people from divorcing, so it happens anyway, and following church guidelines increases your chances of marrying young, you know, so you can do the sex. But people who get married young are significantly more likely to end up divorced than those who wait until they are over 25. And as to recreational drug use, marijuana is basically the least harmful drug you could have possibly chosen. Yeah, the medicinal claims are mostly BS, but ultimately marijuana is less Less harmful than alcohol, and the Bible definitely approves of drinking, at least in moderation, while it never explicitly condemns other drug use. On top of that, taking actions that are less judgmental, for instance decriminalizing drug possession and use, and instituting supervised injection sites for safe recreational drug use, have positive impacts on society, with fewer overdose deaths, fewer disease transmissions from dirty needles like hepatitis and HIV, and overall lower drug use. These effects come about not just due to government policy, but also in how the population views drug use. Stigmatizing it and being judgmental about it like the church wants to do makes things much, much worse. So when the church is pushing a moral code that is demonstrably harmful, then the church needs to come to grips with the fact that they are not working in people's best interests and need to change. But of course, God is perfect, so even when God's policies are demonstrably harmful, they must actually be good. It can't be that the church is wrong, all the data has to be wrong. Am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. You don't like the fact that the church is saying that same-sex marriages are a sin and all these things. And so because you might be struggling with some of these things, you are naturally saying that the church is intolerant and the church is judgmental. Yes. And your language surrounding these issues is reinforcing that. You refer to people struggling with same-sex attraction as though it's something that is to be fought against, when in reality, it's none of your goddamn business who people are attracted to, and there's no good reason to try and force people to conform to your narrow view on sexuality. But yeah, the book that thinks genetics are determined by what sticks you're looking at while having sex also thinks that gay stuff is icky, therefore we must live our lives in accordance with this book. So that's the first thing that might be happening is because you're looking at yourself and you're saying, hey, the church is now infringing upon my freedom to do what I want to do, and I don't want to feel guilty about it. More that the church tries to make people feel guilty for things they have no control over and which should not be a source of guilt in the first place. It's weaponized guilt. Make people feel guilty when they sin, and they have to come back to us for absolution. So make sure that things that are natural, normal, harmless, and often irresistible biological urges are labeled as sinful, so that's pretty much a guarantee that everyone will struggle with them and need to come to us. It's more than a little gross. But the second thing that you may say about the church is that it's intolerant because of how it views other people. Yeah, there's that too. I've had more than my fair share of Christians telling me all the things that they know for sure about me based on nothing more than the fact that I use the word atheist. They know that I'm mad at God, that someone hurt me, and that I'm redirecting that hurt at God for allowing that to happen, that I just want to sin, etc, etc. Do you think all these people coming at me insisting that they know me better than I know myself are going to make me feel like the church is willing to tolerate my existence? Or do you think it comes across as more the church trying to explain away why people like me can even exist in the first place in an attempt to sweep me under the rug where the Christians won't be exposed to me or my ideas? And how likely do you think I am to want to go to a place where these intolerant people with mistaken ideas about my motivations will all be gathered together? You may say, okay, well, hey, the church says that these people can't live an alternative lifestyle or whatever. So here's the thing you have to be careful about, Mr. or Miss Millennial, is the fact that you can't blame the church for simply um, promoting or, or presenting, if you will, a biblical approach to what's going on in the world. Yes, you absolutely can. Because 
Every church, every denomination, every individual Christian ignores huge swaths of scripture in order to promote the version of the religion that they personally prefer, and each one claiming to be adhering to the real biblical teaching. The antebellum slave owners were, as they thought, living biblically, because the Bible endorses slavery and commands slaves to obey their masters, and commands Christian masters to not threaten their slaves. It doesn't say release them, just don't threaten them. And this is Ephesians chapter 6, this is New Testament stuff. You, Alan, don't approve of slavery and claim that the Bible does not endorse it, and you call that a biblical view, even though you had to blatantly edit the Bible in order to get to that view. Well, it's very easy to disagree and say that the biblical view includes rules that permit slave ownership. In fact, it's easier to disagree, because in pointing out that the Bible does permit and endorse slave ownership, I don't have to remove parts of verses like Alan did in his video trying to argue otherwise. The church is merely a conduit between God and man. Which church? There are thousands of different denominations that all teach conflicting things about God, and many would actually disagree with your assessment that the church is the conduit between God and man, instead going for the it's not a religion, it's a relationship thing. The church merely presents, or is a mailman, if you will, where they're presenting what God has already spoken. So you can't get mad at the church. If you want to say somebody's intolerant or judgmental, you need to point the finger at God, because God is the one who said these things are not good and these things are. And yet, whenever I make a video explaining why the God of the Bible is an immoral monster, I inevitably get a handful of comments from Christians telling me that I have no right to judge God. We live in this crazy, demonic, insane day where people judge God. How dare I presume to call God an immoral monster? Don't I know that God is the source of morality? So yeah, to answer this, I would agree. If the God of the Bible exists, he is an immoral monster that doesn't deserve to be worshipped, and so I wouldn't support an organization dedicated to worshipping him. Add on to that the fact that this God apparently does not exist, and that leaves us with a bunch of immoral organizations attempting to impose their immorality not only on their followers, but on everyone living in society with them. So, is this a valid claim that the church is intolerant? Yes, by your own admission, the church is intolerant because it uses intolerant documents as its foundation. I would say that's probably not valid. Which is really weird, because you agreed that it was intolerant, but then you just shifted the blame. Don't blame me for being intolerant, blame God. God's the one who's intolerant. Which is actually a really gross position to hold when you think about it. Since God doesn't exist, he has now become your shield. I'm not a bad person for believing these bad things, it's God's fault! Except there are churches that are available to you that do not believe those bad things, they make it work with the Bible somehow, and you choose to go to the intolerant church. Why? Because you agree with what it teaches. You are intolerant and are using God as an excuse for your intolerance. The second major claim against the church is that the church is not authentic. I mean, they keep preaching about helping those in need, and then having scandals surrounding them where they abuse those who are in need that they're supposed to be helping. So yeah, I can see that. And what I believe they're saying here is that, you know what, hey, I would just love to see some people in the church that are really real and really uh, vulnerable and transparent with really what's going on in their life because they walk around as if they have these perfect lives, these perfect marriages, and these perfect children, but underneath the surface, their lives are not really that. I don't think that's what that means, because it's actually a trope of sermons that the pastor, when preaching against a specific sin, will admit that they have struggled with that themselves, and they aren't perfect, they still struggle with it. I think it's more the practice what you preach thing. Like for instance, the Catholic Church once fired a priest for having gay orgies with consenting adults. Had the priest partners been children, though, he wouldn't have been fired, he would have been moved to a community that was unaware of the abuse, possibly in a country that doesn't have an extradition treaty if there were authorities involved. Sometimes they would even be promoted in the process. 
So when people see stuff like that, the message that it sends is that being gay with consenting adults is worse to the church than abusing children. They have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to legal consensual activities, but as soon as it becomes an illegal and non-consenting activity, we have to act with forgiveness and compassion for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes. And yes, the Catholic Church is the easy target for these kind of examples, but it is by no means exclusive to them. And so a lot of millennials are saying, hey, we would love to see church members or leaders share a little bit more about their real struggles and what's really going on in their life because we can't relate to perfect people. Yeah, like I said, church leaders sharing their struggles with sin from the pulpit is a trope at this point. So no, I don't think that's what that means. Not for most, anyway. I don't know, this one's kind of subjective, so I might be wrong on the interpretation, but this is how I see it. So is this a valid reason for why millennials may not want to be in church? Yes, but not because church leaders aren't willing to admit to the sins that they preach against, but because church leaders are regularly found abusing their positions of authority. I would probably say, yeah, that's pretty valid because a lot of church people try to front and act like they have everything going on. But the third reason why I believe that many millennials are not wanting to go to church, and many of them have confirmed this, is that they just believe that the church is filled with hypocritical people. That's literally the same point you just made. People that say one thing and do something else. Now, what I will say to a millennial on this one is that this, I believe, comes from an unrealistic expectation about what church people are supposed to be about. Yeah, how dare we expect preachers to practice what they preach? If you go to church and you're expecting everybody there to have it all together or to be perfect or to not be hypocritical any more than the people at your job or anywhere else that you go in the world, I think you're setting yourself up for an unrealistic expectation. If I found out that the company I worked for was receiving charitable contributions which people expected were going to doing good works in the community, but they were instead using that money to protect their higher level employees that have been caught engaging in illegal and immoral activity, I would leave that company and make as much noise about it as I could. Why does the church feel like they can be held to a lower standard than a secular organization while at the same time preaching what they see as a higher standard? So that now when you peel back the layers of these people's lives and you see that they're struggling with different things, then now you're like, okay, well, I don't want to be a part of this because these people are hypocritical. What's interesting is that you don't quit your job if your job is filled with hypocritical people. Most jobs have nothing to do with what you do in your personal life. If you say that porn is bad but watch porn anyway, that has zero impact on your ability to do construction or whatever job you want to use as an example. But if your job is literally to preach about the evils of porn, but it turns out you use it just as frequently as everybody else does, then that is directly related to that job. The equivalent here is not looking at how people behave in their personal lives, but in their professional lives. If a construction worker is not in the habit of building things according to local codes, but says that they are, that is a serious problem that should probably cost them their job. If an accountant fudges the numbers in their books but says they didn't, that is a problem that should potentially cost them their job. These are examples of professional hypocrisy, and when the hypocrisy is relevant to the job they are doing, the appropriate course of action is often termination, and sometimes they may be subject to criminal investigations and charges. But for some reason, religious leaders are not held to the same high standards. So is this a valid reason to not go to church because the church is filled with hypocritical people? No, I don't believe it is. Well, you'd be wrong then, especially since this is essentially the same as the previous point you made, which you said was valid. Because if they are hypocritical, that's where they need to be anyway. Nope. Try evidence-based therapy before you try religion. It's got a much better track record. Now, another claim that millennials may make as it relates to why they don't want to go to church or what's wrong with the church today is that the church is just not relevant to their daily lives. As long as the church is tying itself to the Bible, it really isn't. The Bible is a fascinating look into ancient history, but it is not a guidebook for how to live your life, despite what apologists like Alan will claim. And this is demonstrated by the fact that apologists like Alan feel the need to remove verses from context and chop them up in order to eliminate the distasteful bits in order to even make the claim that the Bible doesn't condone immoral things that the Bible clearly condones. Just do the same thing with the gay verses, Alan. It's not that hard. Wink, wink. 
There are fewer verses in the Bible condemning homosexuality than there are verses allowing slavery, and somehow you did come to the conclusion that the Bible does not allow slavery, just apply that same motivated reasoning to the issues that the culture has come to accept that you still think the Bible condemns, and you'll be set. I'll even start you off in the right direction. Linked in my description is a paper published in the Journal of Bible and Culture, which explains how all of the passages that Christians use to condemn homosexuality weren't actually about homosexuality. And the arguments against the idea that the Bible condemns homosexuality actually have better grounds than the ones arguing that biblical slavery wasn't really slavery. Which brings me to another point. If there is an all-powerful God out there and he wants to send us a message, do you really think he would do it through a method that is so subject to interpretation that you can make it say anything you want it to? Now, while some aspects of church should be relevant, what we have to be careful about here is that we need to understand that the Bible is not a self-help book. Amen to that. Right? And so whenever the preachers may preach from something like um, poetry or a genre like prophecy or uh, let's see, uh, narratives or history or proverbs or all these different types of things, listen, should the preachers just not preach from any of these parts of the Bible because after all, prophecy is not relevant or some of the Old Testament history books are not relevant to where you are? I mean, yeah. Why would I waste my time listening to a sermon that is entirely irrelevant to my life? Who cares about the genre of the book that they're preaching from? The Bible is not a self-help book, right? So you have to understand that the whole purpose of the church is not to just make everything and every sermon relevant to your life. It's to give you what they know you need in order to grow spiritually, even though it may not be completely relevant to your life. So basically, yeah, it's irrelevant, but go listen anyway. I can't wait until he gets to the part where he explains how to win millennials back to the church, given his poor understanding of the concepts that he's presenting. Should be interesting. So is this claim valid? I guess you could say it's valid only from the perspective that I don't think that the church or the Bible was intended to always be perfectly relevant to your life. That is a really weird admission from a Christian. Usually it'll be taught that the Bible is universally relevant. You can find stuff in the Bible that's relevant to any situation. And God will often speak through preachers by putting a message on their hearts that will be relevant to the lives of those who need to hear it. So I guess all that's off the table? Now, the next claim that many millennials will make is that the church is not concerned with culture. No, the way you have it written on screen is a better way of saying it. The church is detached from culture. Yes, obviously the church is concerned with culture. That's why it's trying so hard to hamstring cultural progress. Because cultural progress chips away at the church's control of culture. But it is detached from culture, seemingly oblivious to significant changes in the culture until years and sometimes decades after they happen. They are detached from culture because one of the things that many millennials will say is that, you know, they want to see change going on in the culture. They want to see our society change. They're uh, proponents of like racial equality and social justice and some of these other things that are going on in the world. And you're not? You don't want racial equality and social justice? And they look at the church and they're like, you guys are preaching sermons from Zechariah and Malachi or whatever, and the world is going in this direction and you are the church and you don't even care. Yeah, the church is stuck in the past. It gets dragged along with the culture eventually, kicking and screaming. It always succumbs to cultural pressure, but it never leads the charge in things like equality or justice. And yeah, the excuse for this is that if God were real and the Bible is actually his message, then you would expect that message to withstand the test of time. But unfortunately for you, it really doesn't. And then the church looks at the current culture and makes proclamations about the depravity among the youth nowadays. And then they wonder why the youth don't come to church anymore. Well, this cultural lagging is just more evidence that it's not true. God could have said, hey, gay people are fine. There's nothing wrong with that. No need to treat them any differently than you would treat straight people. But instead, he said to stone them to death. Their blood is on their own heads. And then these proclamations lead to the suffering of people that are not choosing their sexuality and, given the social pressure, would have probably chosen to not be gay if they actually did have a choice in the matter. So this leaves us wondering, why is the all-powerful creator of the universe so very concerned with what we do with our genitals? Isn't that a rather petty thing for God to get hung up on? Are there no more important concerns that he could have brought up in his book? 
So is this a valid claim? Well, let me just first of all say this, that the church's ultimate overall mission is to impact people's lives eternally. Yes. And when you can't actually do anything to demonstrate that we actually get an eternal existence, the unwillingness to change with the times comes across as an outdated organization using fictional carrots and sticks to attempt to control people. And not just temporarily, temporarily on this earth. So the main focus, the main priority of the church is not to, to accomplish some sort of social justice that's going on in the world. Yes, we have noticed that the church is completely unconcerned with accomplishing real-world justice things. It's to make sure that people's eternal lives and their eternal state, right, is going to be with the Father. Yeah, well, Jesus didn't say that gay people can't go to heaven. If you're truly worried about people's eternal souls, shouldn't you work to change the church to actually care about the causes that you see as being the causes that are causing millennials to stop going to church? No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't fit another cause into there. Wouldn't that be a better way to win souls than to alienate those who you are supposedly trying to help? The greatest commandment is to love God. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, at least according to Jesus. That's not some of the law and prophets. It is all of the law and prophets. So it doesn't hang on preaching against sex outside of marriage or against LGBTQ rights or any of that stuff. It's on love. When you choose to make it about these other things, you are implicitly admitting that you care more about these non-issues than about the words of the man that you think was God in the flesh. So we need to be careful about expecting the church to do something or be something that even God may not have ever intended them to be. According to your own book, God said that the entire law and prophets are summed up by commands to love God and love your neighbor. So if it's anything that's not love, it's not what God intended it to be. Well, I mean, he also once ended a parable with a command to bring my enemies and slaughter them before me. And yeah, that's a parable, so it's easy to interpret as not meaning exactly what it says, but it was a parable where the guy giving that command was an analogy for God, so it's also really easy to take that as meaning exactly what it says. So yeah, once again, we come up against the problem that the Bible can mean anything to anybody. So really, when you get certain things out of it, that says more about you than it does about the Bible. Now I have a whole other video where I talk about whether or not the church should be involved in issues of justice. And given your history, you probably come out on the wrong side at the end of that one. But I would say that yes, yes they should, in a positive way, not in the way it's currently involved where it's trying desperately to drag everything down. And actually, I decided to go look at that video. Surprisingly, he comes out on the side of churches joining the fights against injustice. So I guess he's pro-LGBTQ rights, right? No, of course he isn't. He made a video about how to deal with a child coming out as LGBTQ and opened it by essentially saying that being gay is the worst possible thing that a child can do to their parent, which will crush all of the parent's hopes and dreams for that child. When everything that you thought that they would be now comes crashing down. Let me first say that if you are watching this video and you are dealing with that level of disappointment or pain or heartache because your child has come out or you're starting to see signs that maybe they're having issues in this area. Gross. And then the last claim that many millennials will make is that, you know what? The church is not really adding any major value to my life. Like, yeah, it teaches hateful and harmful things, and none of it appears to be based on any truth. So I would say that this claim is a true one. And the reality is that that's a valid claim. You don't. <laughs> you don't, right? So you don't need to go to church to for any of these things. Any of these things here refers to the list of things that Alan gave that I skipped that you can get without going to church, like a fulfilling career, a loving family, etc. Basically, all of the most important things in life. But going to church, the bride of Christ, is what helps you grow closer to God. Except God does not appear to exist, especially not the Christian God. So I can get all of the most important things in life without the church, and the only function the church serves is to enhance your relationship with a God that doesn't exist. So yeah, I think I'll continue sleeping in on Sundays. 
Well, no, I don't actually. Sunday is when I record and edit the podcast that I have with my daughter. New episode coming out this Sunday. If you're interested, link is in the description. So I read the Bible diligently every Sunday, which is probably more than you can say for your average church going Christian. So now we've addressed whether these claims for millennials are valid or not. So now I want to switch gears and I want to talk to the church. What is it that we can do as church leaders to hopefully win this millennial generation back? You could try convincing God to actually start existing and stop being so regressive. Those are probably the two biggest things you could do right there. And now the first thing that I would say is that we as a church need to be more inclusive. And what I mean here is that far too often you have too many churches that are making all of these major decisions about what is happening in the church and they seldom, if ever, include other younger millennials in those decisions. And so as a result, many millennials don't feel like the church is for them. Sure, that's actually decent advice for the church. I doubt it'll happen anytime soon, you know, on account of the whole millennials are more progressive than the older generations thing. But yeah, if we're stuck with religion for now, at least religion could stop being a dick. Number two, we gotta let go of some of our traditions, right? I don't know. I saw a tweet not long ago about how the Catholic Latin Mass appeals to young people and gets them energized and excited about their faith. Are you sure millennials want to let go of traditions? Because a lot of Catholics right now are convinced that the thing that young people really want is a service given entirely in a dead language. The way that this generation receives the word of God and understands things very well may be different than what's going on in your church. Right. So they may receive from somebody who wears skinny jeans right? they may receive from somebody who is up on stage uh, rapping or doing spoken word. That's how this generation understands and receives truth. When churches do stuff like that, it almost always comes across as really, really cringy. What I'm saying is that, yes, please, please do those things, but make sure they get recorded for posterity. My crew is big and it keeps getting bigger. That's because Jesus Christ is my name. No, no, God damn it, no, not like that. Let his love pop a cap in your butt and say hallelujah. Number three, focus more on social issues. And notice I didn't say focus only on social issues, but focus more on social issues. Yeah, promote equal rights for everyone, including members of the LGBTQ community. I'm not sure how Alan squares this with the garbage he spews about LGBTQ people, unless when he says focus on, what he really means is focus on fighting against. Number four is community. Many of the responses that I got in my post were the fact that many millennials just don't feel any sense of community when they go to church. Community is actually pretty much the only value that a church adds to someone's life. Anytime you see an apologist hold up one of those studies that finds that religious people live longer and are happier and healthier, there's almost always caveats in those studies about how it's not the religion that makes them happy or healthy, because then you'd expect the effect to only be present for the one true religion, but rather it's the community that has that effect, because believers who don't attend church don't see the same benefits, and non-believers who are part of a strong community do see the same benefit, as well as the benefit being present regardless of the religion of the person attending religious services. And so why not create community in your church that allows people to come? So, Orgy Church? Sweet, where do I sign up? Number five, and this is a huge one, start dealing with the tough questions. I cannot tell you how many people come to me on my channel and say, hey, Brother Allen, thank you so much for dealing with the questions that we have, because when we go to our church, we're just told to just accept it by faith or we're just told, hey, you know what? I'm not sure of the answer to that, but you know what? Just believe it's true or whatever. The idea that anyone is coming to Allen for life advice is legitimately concerning to me. This generation is dealing with same sex attraction. They're dealing with lust. They're dealing with having uh, inappropriate websites on their phone. And none of those things are inherently problematic. So preaching sermons against them is actually an excellent way to make sure millennials stay out of your church. And then the last thing that I'll say is this issue of substance. This one surprised me, but many millennials said that they feel like the sermons are watered down. They feel like it, uh, one person said that it felt more like, uh, what did they say? They said they felt it more like a, a, a rock concert and a stand-up comedy, right? Eh, 
Personally, I don't think it's really possible to give a substantive message when your starting point is a book as immoral and irrelevant as the Bible. Well, that's enough of that. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Nezumi, who says, I've sometimes gotten the sense from your videos that you kind of hold to the weird Christian idea that Judaism is basically Christianity but older and worse, rather than a substantively different belief system. Islam is actually closer to Christianity than Judaism is. It's also closer to Judaism than Christianity is. There's a lot of differences, of which I know only some. Well, I'm sorry if I've given that impression. I know I've made a point of saying on a couple of occasions that modern-day Jews probably don't appreciate the Christians taking their scriptures and twisting them to fit the Christian religion, but that message can get lost in the background fairly easily, because I spend so much of my time responding to videos that start with the assumption that all Jewish scriptures are actually Christian scriptures that the Jews are misinterpreting. So you are correct in pointing out that there are huge differences. I'm not entirely sure I agree with your placement of Islam as being more similar to Christianity than Judaism and more similar to Judaism than Christianity, but I'm also not entirely sure that I disagree. Thanks for watching, thanks to this week's PayPal hero David, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clint Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest. Who are the social pressure that drags the church that is my channel kicking and screaming into the modern age? If you'd like to make sure my morality gets regular updates but still stays a century or two out of date, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as the link to my podcast with my daughter, and links to my social media accounts, and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! Worldwide, Islam is on track to be the dominant religion by 2050, but we're just talking about... <sighs> Fuck you, Gmail. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. <sighs> Too many. Too many emails. Oh, God.